Hello, my true believers. It is me, Odir, and welcome back to the Odir Podcast. This is your host, Odir Herrera, and yeah, we're kind of in that period. I got two more weeks, and I feel like, you know what? Marvel has been a bit of, you know, struggles lately. There's cinematic universe between phases. Phase one through three, masterpiece. A true, let's say, story arc that's been building since the beginning of Iron Man until, you know, Avengers Endgame more as they canonically want to say Spider-Man Far From Home. But to me, I feel like the Marvel characters as a unit, I'm like, okay, we all got our favorites, we all got our Avengers, our Spider-Mans. But there's been a team out there that's been left out of the limelight for a while. I know they exist, and everybody knows they kind of exist, and they kind of did make the resurgence back in March. On the animated side, the X-Men. And yes, I'm going to be talking about the X-Men movies. So far, I'm going to talk about my experiences with those movies, and the fact that I grew up in a period where this was all new and everything was still coming out as it was because we had no x-men movies back in the day we had basically every cinematic universe thing we have right now was just as just a franchise all the spider movies were in its own universe hulk in his own universe the x-men in their own selective universe with the fox same with the fantastic four and daredevil but nowadays we have the marvel cinematic universe crossovers galore but no these movies had an advantage where Yes, the early 2000s were more of an experimental phase where people at studios would pick up property and say, okay, let's see what we can do with this. And with X-Men, I can say for a fact that the first one specifically, I didn't watch it till later in life. Around when I found out, there were, I'm going to be honest, and this is going to be a bit of a story time again. So my first experience with X-Men was with the animated series. Everybody knows that. Everybody watched it early days on JetX in my period. I know you guys watched it on Fox Kids, but I got to first experience it on JetX, even the crossover with Spider-Man. But I didn't know that later on in life they would actually make X-Men live-action movies because, you know, I was around, um, The Last Stand came around 2006, and my first time seeing an X-Men-related thing was the trailer for X-Men Origins Wolverine. And as a kid, you must be thinking, oh, that must be cool, right? We'll get there. But for right now, let's start from the very beginning. Yes, the very beginning. With the first X-Men. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now seeing the beginnings of another stage of human evolution. The truth is that mutants are very real. And they are among us. We must know who they are, and above all, what they can do. We're not what you think, not all of us. Who are you people? What kind of place is this? I'm Professor Charles Xavier. I built this school where mutants could learn to focus their powers in a positive way, and also learn that mankind was not evil. Just uninformed. You'll be safe here from Magneto, a very powerful mutant who believes that a war is brewing between mutants and the rest of humanity. There is a war coming. You sure you're on the right side? future Charles not them they no longer matter hold on to something
give up on them. Mankind has evolved. Not anymore. To be honest, it's kind of funny looking at early 2000s trailers. It's almost like a sci-fi movie. They were like, you know what? Yeah, we could just experiment with this and let's see if anybody's going to watch it. But if I'm being real with you, the first X-Men movie, I wasn't around during the whole beginning of the superhero genre. I already know that we had DC do their thing in the early 80s and 90s and Marvel tried stepping their foot in that area, but through a couple missteps the only one they had successful was the hulk with the tv series but with the live action side of things the movies weren't as good up until when 1999 when blade was released and that was a superhero movie or in this case a first time marvel movie that people thought they're really taking themselves seriously on this one okay what other properties do we have because around the early um, 90s some of the major properties were sold over to studios the X-Men were sold over to 20th Century Fox with the Fantastic Four and Daredevil characters. Sony took Spider-Man and Paramount basically had everybody else. While Universal struggled with the Hulk and all that, all their characters, Namor, and I feel like there's some other ones too that I'm not sure are with Universal, but there's a couple few that I'm like, Universal owns them, and I feel like it's not going to be exactly what we want for our universe, but let's get back to the X-Men. And um, the first time I've seen it was earlier on in my later years because I kind of watched them out of order where the first one, looking at it as an origin movie and basically the introduction to these characters, I think it was interesting enough that the fact that I watched the cartoon and it's that thing where they translate a cartoon to live action. Hopefully it will translate the same, but really not where I expected some of the more flashy animated colors like everybody expected the jumpsuits and stuff like that. But no, this movie, rather than look, or should I say, try to explore the comic book-ness, or everything, instead of everything looking comic booky, everything looked real, or in this case, we were living in a world where mutants exist, and this is going to be the start of that problem. Because in X-Men, the thing I've realized, and I feel like some of the more motives and storylines for X-Men are being expanded on nowadays, is that the way I looked at X-Men, I'm like... Okay, so these people are against these group of people known as mutants. Mutants are people born with the X gene and giving them extraordinary powers. And the way I saw it, I'm like, okay, that's basically almost like these people hating on these certain group of people because of powers. And it's not only till later on in life I hear that that was supposed to be basically a representation of the whole civil rights movement where the whole thing where mutants were represented as African Americans, well people or should I say humans were basically the oppressor saying oh no they don't need rights they can't live with us we don't want dirty mutants around and all that wasn't shed in the first movie where in the cartoon I'm like okay so they don't like superheroes or they don't like these people because they have powers and you saw in that whole cartoon where all the humans were bad and all the mutants were actually trying to do good even if they were trying to do good they still saw them as villains but with the movies it did its own thing by telling a certain story around a certain couple of mutants because if I'm going to be honest, I didn't see it as a big of an issue mainly because I like these characters as much and there are some I like more than others. But in the first movie, I kind of find it funny that looking back on it, that all these X-Men type movies always pushed it for Wolverine to be the main character or should I say the main one we're following because I know that Wolverine is an important character and, and as a character on his own, he's still amazing healing adamantium claws and also the fact that hugh jackman at the time wasn't like a big name and it's funny looking back on this because i was like okay i know these characters based off how i know them now when i see these actors i'm gonna think of the character but hugh jackman specifically it's funny when um earlier on in his life he was more of a theater kid he was a th uh someone who worked on broadway and stuff like that and it's funny when i look at the discord and see people's reactions to him and being wolverine is that, okay, so you're going to get a Broadway actor to be Wolverine that those roles don't match up and I don't know why they would cast somebody like that until you see him the first time when you see him go into the cage match and you see him just drinking that beer and actually just moving his neck. You hear metal screeches every time he hits somebody and you're like, yep, they got it. Especially the iconic cigar too. Wolverine smoking? I was like, yep, that's a cool ass character. But not only that, but there are other X-Men in this first movie. I feel like 
are misrepresented, but I'm like, okay, I see them from the way they were based on this movie, but I'm like, me looking at it now, I'm like, okay, I get it. But somehow being experimental works with this movie because you have your main line of X-Men that everybody knows, like Wolverine, Cyclops, Storm, Jean, Rogue, even some unexpected ones like they try introducing like Iceman, Pyro. But they're not really main liners in this one just yet. The main ones you get to deal with are Wolverine, Jean, Cyclops, and Storm. And Professor X. But my thing is that with this movie, the way they introduce them, it's cool seeing the little bit of relationships they have with each other. Because I know within the comics and in the animated series, Cyclops is supposed to be like the main character, the leader. Since he's the one who helped, you know, form the X-Men with Charles and... And Charles entrusted all that responsibility with him. But with Jean, I feel like those two characters specifically in the first movie, there were more sidelined characters than expected because I know that everything is supposed to revolve around those two since they're the higher ups in the team. But Wolverine as the main character and him being like the outsider joining in on the group, I liked it for what it was and shows that something is wrong with this character because comic fans would know, okay, I get why Wolverine would rather be alone since he's immortal. He's basically wants to be on his own and doesn't want to suffer through the hands of anybody else and something would be his fault. But with this movie, I like the fact that they kind of paired him up with Rogue. Even though Rogue in this movie is not Rogue, played by Anna Paquin, I know who she was, but I'm like looking at it now, I'm like, uh, I don't see Rogue. The more characteristics I'm seeing from you, it feels like it could have been Jubilee, but I feel like the studio thought... Okay, Jubilee is not that big of a character, and we don't want something ridiculous to look weird, like throwing sparks. So, yeah, we're going to go with another baseline character. Okay, who can we choose? Gambit? No. The girl that can touch things but can't fly? Okay, yeah, we'll pick that one, Rogue. But I feel like Rogue in this movie, I'm like, eh. Besides all the X-Men movies doing their thing with characters, Rogue is the one I feel like they actually didn't use that much and very well. Because I feel like with Rogue's characters that she can't touch anything. And she's not, you know, doing the whole thing where she can fly. She's scared most of the time, all teenage girl angsty. But I feel like if they were to switch up the character and not have her be Rogue, and it would have been Jubilee, it would have been, okay, almost like the cartoon where you see her trying to at least accept this group or at least follow under Wolverine as their father figure or their leader figure. But eh, besides a couple flaws with that side, I feel like, eh. They misrepresented Rogue, but eh, the movies won't acknowledge it later on as they get along. But the villains in this case, this is something I feel like most movies would new would wouldn't do nowadays because you get your certain line of villains that are like, okay, we'll do the character but not do more of the things that resemble the character or the history of the characters. But in this, for the few villains we get in this movie, and we there are a few, we get Magneto, Sabretooth, Toad, and Mystique. And for the most part, Everybody looks and acts as well as they do because Ian McKellen as Magneto is one of the highlights of these movies. Him and um, Patrick Stewart as Charles because I feel like their camaraderie is like, damn, we know one of them is good, the other one is not. We get their ideologies and they both have a history even though the movies would explore that later on among the timeline. But with the first movie showing them off, I kind of like the way that they're like, okay, we know you're doing good. And the way that they introduce some of the other characters because Sabretooth isn't introduced until he meets up with Wolverine. And yes, they don't share a bit of dialogue with each other, but we like, oh, we know the characters. We know they're out there and it looks like they got that history. Even their accuracy to the costumes because Sabretooth, yeah, he has the golden um, hair, the mane. Even the jacket, including Toad, where he has the goggles and the long tongue. Yes, it would look ridiculous, but then again, it's like, oh, we'll accept it because these are mutants. We accept the weirdness in this world. Including Mystique where I don't know where the reptilian style came from. I'm not sure if it was inspired by something. But the way Mystique shifted in that first movie, I'm like, wow. I don't know. I'm kind of young and I feel like this is awakening something in me. Because Mystique, I mainly saw her as like a shapeshifter. And the way that they introduced her costume in the early 90s with the white um, dress thing. I'm like, okay, so th that's going to look cool on screen. It's going to look evil and stuff but i'm like oh they're gonna have her naked through this whole thing that's a choice hopefully it works but um yeah so far for the first movie everything has been 
let's say a good starting ground for the first movie. I feel like it was a way to just establish the characters, show off that this is, this whole X Men thing isn't just for kids, and the fact that they even let them wear their respective costumes, but not really because I could say the black leather isn't cool on any of their costumes except maybe Storm. But if I'm really gonna acknowledge a good, accurate comic book costume, I feel like in this case. Magneto had an accurate enough costume to the fact that yes he has the helmet he has the cape he even has the little floating thing where he can just step on and use his magnetism to move it I'm like okay that's cool and accurate as long as you make it look cool nobody's gonna care about colors and there's even a line that Wolverine even mentions like you really go outside of these and Cyclops responds with well what would you prefer yellow spandex and the all share a laugh I'm like yeah we know it's a base a reference to the costume but I'm like nobody cares about the colors of the costume unless they look cool we care if they look cool not if it looks ridiculous but besides that I feel like the first X-Men movie was a good starting ground for the franchise not only that but also the fact that this was something I feel like Marvel was testing to see what would work and what wouldn't because we wouldn't get any other characters that would be flashy and all colorful until Spider-Man that came out around two years after this but I feel like with the starting ground of the X-Men, I'm like, okay, we got this whole group of established characters down. Hopefully with the next one, we can actually do a lot better. And I'm just going to say it. They did. Doesn't it ever wake you in the middle of the night? The feeling that someday they will pass that foolish law and come for you and your children. Take you all away. It does indeed. I feel a great swell of pity for the poor soul who comes to that school looking for trouble. You should have killed me when you had the chance! I'm gonna kill him! Bobby! No! No! Welcome, Professor. You haven't told him about his past. Who is he? I can't remember. Sometimes anger can help you survive. X2 X-Men United was released in 2003 and this movie hit quite a real improvement over the first one where yep this is how superhero movies should be taking some of the things from the first one expanding on it mainly Wolverine and his storyline with a weapon X because in the first one you get brief glimpses of what happened to him and everything with his flashbacks and everything with his dreams him being awake in the night and feeling like something is out there that he can't unveil because of his past. And yeah, that was the main focus on this one where William Stryker comes in to say, oh, that whole Professor X school for the gifted, that's actually a school for mutants. What if one day mutants will actually come out in the middle of the night, walk through banks, some might even say, take over the White House. And surely enough, that does happen in this movie from the fact that this movie not only brought back some X-Men, but also found a way to introduce newer characters and say, okay, they weren't in the first one, but hopefully they get their shine in this one, where Iceman and Pyro become pivotal characters, where they're actually part of the team and along for the journey. And newcomer Nightcrawler to the group where, yes, it's cool seeing certain mutants represented, but Nightcrawler especially, I'm like, that's one I feel like it is kind of a risky move because we haven't seen... Besides sci-fi and things like that, we haven't seen characters in full-blown ex extraordinary makeup. Yes, we've seen Mystique in the first movie and Sabretooth and Toe to a degree. But with Nightcrawler, his thing is that he could teleport whenever he can. 
And the fact that he's fighting his own demon, seeing that he doesn't know if he's a mistake from God or whether or not God is testing him, that is all represented here. And I'm like, that is a good repre- representation of Nightcrawler. Hopefully we get to see him along the journey as the movies go on. But not only that, I feel like mostly X2 had to deal with a lot that, yes, we're going to actually do a lot we can with this, separate the teams. Because that's one thing that this movie has, unlike every other X movie, is that all the characters are each within their own individual storylines. Wolverine and the main X-Men crew dealing with their past. Storm and um, Jean going out with Nightcrawler. Charles kidnapped and in the hands of William Stryker and his son. While Magneto is still feeling like, okay, we have to get back Charles, but then again, I have to team with my team up with this crew because enemy of my enemy is my friend type of deal. But not only that, I feel like this movie did a lot in expanding the lore between Wolverine out of everybody else because we get to go back to Alkali Lake and see everything that happened with the whole Weapon X project. Seeing now is that not only do we have a new villain with Stryker, we also have some companions with him. Not all of them, but at least we have one Lady Deathstrike, which it's funny because I remember seeing her in the Hulk versus animation first. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, she has to have ties with Wolverine. But in this movie, they make her out to be like one of the henchmen that she's just... And it explains it later on, but in the, throughout the movie, she's mainly like more like a mindless slave. She's doing every bidding she can for Stryker. She's not in control of her body. But it's funny the fact that, okay, slowly with every movie, they can find a way to introduce new the newer X-Men characters. But at least try to say that, yes, they have a relationship, but not really. But it's more of the fact that these movies find a way, being experimental, doing as much as they can to expand while not trying to at least deviate from the comic book audience watching it because yes there are certain aspects I'm like okay so Alkali Lay is here so that would mean you have more than just these two subjects so that would mean Sabretooth has to be alive somewhere even though we haven't seen him since the last movie Omega Red has to be here hopefully Dr. Kilbrew to introduce a certain other character but he would come down as the movies come on but I feel like with this movie specifically, yes, it's better than the first movie. And also the fact that it's not afraid to at least acknowledge certain things with the first movie where, yes, mutants are a part of our world now. But at least they're showing that these people, or in this case, these mutants specifically, each have something to contribute. And it it's not like some, oh, all mutants are bad. We're just in the midst of that, in a common goal, when all of our mutant kind is being threatened, at least we can pull that down aside and actually use it to fight. Because, yes, Magneto's a villain, and he, do, and he surely is mistrustworthy, especially the fact that he does everything to at least try to find a way to at least get people on his side. Because Mystique was the only one he had by his side until Pyro, he started noticing that, oh, so you can shoot fire, huh? Be proud of your gifts. You don't have to at least show off to these people and say, oh, just because I have fire powers doesn't mean I'm not a god. Or at least better than these common folk. And it actually led Pyro to go to the dark side and actually be a villain. And set that whole thing up with Iceman. Because Iceman, yes, we get a bit more of him since we did see him in the first movie. He wasn't as much of a character in the first movie. He was just there in the mansion and as one of the students helping out Rogue. But in this we get to see a bit more of their relationship grow. Cyclops actually be weaker than the first movie. Because I feel like Cyclops... Out of everything this whole X-Men franchise, and I'm going to acknowledge this in the, ne- in the next section, that Cyclops, it's more the fact that this is one of the main reasons why I feel like I didn't like Cyclops in these early movies. I'm like, yeah, he's supposed to be the leader and act all cool, but it's like, they're just doing him dirty. They're not giving him a lot to do. And it's not the fact that his characterization is weak, because he's played by James Morrison, which... I like the fact that he was a good Cyclops, but it's just that the writing and everything didn't make him out to be Cyclops. And he barely got anything to do in this movie, but some other characters did, like Jean, where in the beginning, you saw a little bit of the Phoenix Force come in towards her. Like, she's acknowledging the fact that there's a certain voice in her head that she doesn't even know or understand. She saw glimpses of the whole movie in the beginning scenes where she could hear certain voices and see certain predicaments happen. But... For me, I feel like this is the most set up to the Dark Phoenix saga as we were going to get in these movies because you could say that X-Men 1 was a movie in itself, but X-2 at least expanded on that and acknowledged 
okay, we could set certain things up with characters. So like that, later as the movies progress, we can actually see something grow. And they were kind of setting that up for the Dark Phoenix saga in the third movie. Where Jean, she would sacrifice herself for everybody else. And at least say, oh, I hear a voice out there that Jean isn't dead. And the very end of this movie, you get to see whole Jean narrate the whole beginning text with Charles about humanity and mutants. And then you see a glimpse of the phoenix actually rise up within the water. So I'm like, okay, for the next movie, that tells me we're going to set up for the Dark Phoenix Saga. And all of our characters have to actually team up together, actually wash their wounds from this one, seeing that, okay, we're going to deal with loss and everything is going to happen as fast as it can because I feel like they set things up to be the Dark Phoenix Saga. We're going to go to extraordinary ventures and everything seeing that the mutants are actually part of our world now. Whenever you need us, whenever you need help, just call on Charles and the X-Men for actual help. So like that, you don't have to fear us and hopefully there's a new mutant registration law that could actually help within our people ourselves so we can actually live in peace. I'm saying all this now because this is what was set up, but me, this is where I guess I can get to my age range because around this time when all these X-Men movies start coming out, 2006 was when I could say I was four years old and self-aware enough to actually know what things are. I didn't know about the X-Men just yet, but around this time is where I got my actual glimpses of the Marvel Universe where I was young enough to know what the X-Men are. Okay, I know that. But my thing is that I was young enough to the fact where, okay, I watched cartoons, I don't have a computer to actually look this stuff up. So whenever I see a TV commercial or TV thing that explains what that is, I can at least say, oh, that's this. And I know they made movies on this. Because if I'm going to be honest, my real introduction to some of these characters were through Telemundo and novelas and stuff like that. Because, story time, um, I was young enough to know the cartoons. And every Sunday around 8, uh, my mom or dad would put on Telemundo or Televisión. And every Sunday they play like a random movie of the week. And through little glimpses of the commercials they would always put out hours before they would have, I see characters like Spider-Man. I'm like, oh, so they, they got a real life Spider-Man movie. Oh, they have a Hulk movie. Oh, there's a X-Men for real? Like, I didn't know they actually made movies on these characters at the time. I'm like, oh, they made movies about these guys. I like these characters. And around that time was when X3, The Last Stand, was supposed to release. And they actually hit him up with the commercials and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, we're actually going to get another X-Men movie. Hopefully they're going to finish off with the Nice End Trilogy. And they can at least show off the Dark Phoenix as we all know it in the comics. Right? On principle, I can't negotiate with these people. Well, then you know what needs to be done. We're going to protect our citizens. Make no mistake, my brothers. The humans will draw first blood. And the air is still, and the night has fallen. There's only one question you must answer. Who will you stand with? A major pharmaceutical company has developed a way to suppress the mutant X gene permanently. They're calling it a cure. There's nothing to cure. Nothing's wrong with any of us for that matter. You of all people know how fast the weather can change. Did you find what you were looking for? The source of the cure is a mutant. More powerful than you. Something woke her, but she has to be controlled. You know, sometimes when you cage the beast, I can't do this. The beast gets angry. You have no idea. You have no idea what is upon us now. Fury that this world has never witnessed. Magneto's got an army out there. You go to war, you might not come home. She might not come home. You ready for that? We're not kids anymore. Hey, I'm not your father. If you want to go, be sure it's what you want. It's time we make our choice. If you're with us, then be with us. They 
wish to cure us. But I say we are the cure. Look at me, G. We can help you. We can fix it. We can make it like it was. Stay with me, please. With X-Men The Last Stand, I wasn't around for all the hype and all the disappointment back in the day because we got certain things that made this movie good and certain things that made it feel like, okay, so now we don't have any trust in this franchise anymore and I feel like anything they put after this is going to be garbage because we had a change in directors from Brian Singer to <laughs> Brad Ratner and I feel like that whole change in itself, I'm like, okay, that change in direction is interesting because I feel like there's a lot knowing that the fact that the first guy who held these X-Men movies, they have the vision. And I feel like the same director should be held accountable for every other installment in that franchise. But some reason they switched out Brian Singer with Brett Ratner and I feel like, okay, that's something. That's a choice. But not only that, I feel like some of the things and motives they set up in the first two movies were actually gone in this one because... Yes, we get the Dark Phoenix, but not only that, we also get a, a side plot that's basically like the the Cure storyline, and I feel like, okay, that's interesting, the fact that they tried in doing this now, but my thing is that, okay, if you set up the Dark Phoenix, that must mean we're going to set up the Dark Phoenix saga, so like that, you can bring back Gene, show the whole thing in space with the, with the Shira Empire, but I feel like, okay, that's going to be a bit over the top, but hopefully they could try to make, at least make it work. But no, the Dark Phoenix stuff was just put down to the side. And this whole movie movie contributed to the Cure story, which I'm not down for the Cure story. I like the Cure story, but my thing is that you have this story already set up. But why suddenly now in the next movie you introduce this whole thing that's taken over the plot? Because, yeah, we get the whole Cure storyline scene is that, yes, there's a cure for mutants and people want this sort of thing. But the way you introduce some of these characters, I'm like, yeah, we know they exist, but it's more of the fact that they're not extraordinary characters the way we see them. Because the whole thing with the Cure story is that for this movie interpretation, Leech is the one character that they say, or the child they assume has the power to cure mutants. But I'm like, Leech is an underground mutant with the actual group, and you're telling me you turn him into this? Okay, that's a choice. But not only that, also, I'm going to just go with the good on this first. Some of the action in this movie compared to the first two feels more grounded. And somewhat, somehow I feel like, okay, some of the stuff they do in here feels more exciting. And some of the things look more fast-paced than in some of the original movies. Because, yes, you get to see Wolverine do his thing. You get to see certain fights with the Dark Phoenix, which I'm like, okay, visually, this looks cool. Secondly... If Brian Singer did something like this, it wouldn't be as flashy, it wouldn't be as fast. But there are other aspects that they actually introduce, like the mutants. I'm going to go for the new mutants that they actually introduced in this movie. Like, for one, we don't get Nightcrawler back in this one. I don't know why. Because I feel like if you introduce Nightcrawler, that tells me, oh, he's going to be an essential part of the team now, just like in the animations and in the comics. But no, Nightcrawler's not back for this one. But they at least brought in Beast, which we did get a glimpse of Hank McCoy as a human which I don't know how, especially in this timeline, but I feel like they were going to introduce it. Where Hank McCoy was on a TV screen in the bar in X2. And in this movie, you see him in full-on beast makeup played by Kelsey Grammer. And I kind of like that he's not as exaggerated because you feel like with a character like Beast, they do like the Hulk thing. that actually do the whole CGI and at least make it so it's believable that a creature like this would exist in our world. But no, some of the more practical stuff they use in these movies, I feel like is not going to be done today. And I feel like that period is done. And I feel like, yeah, they try to at least make it work. And Beast was cool in this movie. Yes, he, you can tell that it's not going to be like Beast from the comic where he's just muscular and bulky. But no, Hank McCoy and Beast in this movie were combined as one and actually used both essential parts of those characters to at least bring the character to life instead of just being a side character for the third act. Another thing is that some of the villains are at least antagonists in this movie too because, yeah, we get Magneto again. Yes, we get Jean Grey coming back as Phoenix. But also, we get some newer style mutants. So like, we get Multiple Man. We get actual revealing of the Juggernaut, which, 
Yeah, again, like I said again, it's just a guy, a muscular guy in a helmet. Not the full-on CGI t- big bulky guy, but uh, they're trying to make it work. Some of these other mutes were cool, but there are certain ones I feel like, yeah, but then again, I don't know why you, you were used in this movie specifically, which Kitty Pride, I don't even, she was, like, I think in the last movie when um, all the Strikers crew started coming into the mansion and she just teleported through walls to get out of there. I'm like, okay, it's cool that you're introduced here, but why do you have a relationship with um, Iceman for some reason? And that was another thing. Rogue was put on the side too and became the girlfriend character, which she doesn't know why Bobby is even talking to um, Kitty and feels like, oh, so we're not a thing? Okay, so you feel like just because we don't hang out doesn't mean you can't talk to other girls? Just because I can touch you doesn't mean you can touch somebody else? I'm like, oh my God, what happened to these characters? Like what? Like what in between movies happened that it's just confusing to me and I feel like the change in tone did kind of show it off because this movie's a bit more lighter. The CGI and everything is a bit more brighter in this movie and you can tell in certain key sequences. But some of the fights, I can say, are cool enough like the Statue of... Not the Statue of Liberty. Like, compared to the Statue of Liberty fight, you can see everything from there to the Brooklyn Bridge to the whole fight in um, Gene's house to the whole end sequence of this movie, which is basically an all-out last stand between mutants, which, yes, this is amazing, but not only that, there are some characters I feel like haven't been done justice in this movie, like, the three I can think about at the top of my head, I'm gonna go for the first one, because it's obvious, Cyclops, where he's just the mopey guy, Gene is gone, so he feels like he's gotta be depressed, and doesn't care for anybody in the mansion, or at least want to go out and pursue some missions, he dies earlier on in this movie, but also I kind of did realize that it is, it was kind of a commitment to him, where... X-Men The Last Stand and Superman Returns were coming out the same year. One actually directed by Brian Singer. So James Marsden had to at least find a way to get out of X-Men and at least be part of that franchise. But that didn't work out as well. Professor X, which I feel like, yeah, as powerful of a mutant as he was, the way they did his story is that you kind of made it so he's the reason why Gene suppresses this whole memory and the reason why she feels like she has to unlock the Dark Phoenix. But I'm like, what happened to the thing where the accident and something within her brought out the Phoenix Force instead of Charles holding that down? And I feel like, yeah, that kind of diminishes Charles as a professor in this case. Where he can help his students, but he feels like he doesn't need to help and he can just suppress their memories. I'm like, okay, that's kind of dickish of Charles, but okay, we'll see how that goes. And Mystique for the most part because Mystique was a key part in these movies being in and out. But in this movie, they kept her prisoner throughout the whole movie. And not only that, but also be one of the first victims of the mutant cure where she's just depowered and she's just Rebecca Romaine for the rest of the movie and you don't see anything from her. For the most part, I feel like X3, The, the Last Stand... As a movie, it's a disappointment, and also as a third part of a trilogy, it's the weakest. But as an X-Men movie, it has its strengths with some of the action sequences. It has its strengths whenever they want to do something with the mutants and actually do something that Brian Singer hasn't done yet. Because we can't say we haven't seen a full fight between all groups of mutants. Yeah, we got a glimpse of that in the first movie. And in the second one, we get one-on-one key sequences and fights, making the fights personal. But in the third one... Everything was more of a comic book style romp where, yes, this is what comic book movies should be like, but this is not what we want all of our comic book movies to be like with this type of storyline, with this type of plot, and jumbling characters around in different locations knowing how important they were in the previous movies. X3 for what it is, it's not bad, but it's not good either. People say it's one, it's one of the worst movies in this franchise, but I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. For the worst movie in the franchise, I don't really see it like that. But for the most part, hopefully they could at least try to do something different because they did. The X-Men movie stopped after this. There were no more X-Men team-ups. And for the most part, the studio, 20th Century Fox, were going to focus themselves on more X-Men stories. But they wanted to do something different. Call it Origins in this case. Introductions of certain characters. So like that, we could actually introduce them and use them along movies later in the timeline. And they tried to do that with one character everybody find popular. Wolverine and I feel like yeah you kind of did show off um, Wolverine's story in X2 but a full-on movie showing off what happened 
Okay, hopefully everything is going to turn out good because Hugh Jackman was great as Wolverine, and he's basically Wolverine forever at this point, including to this day. So let's take a look at X-Men Origins, Wolverine. Whatever the reason is you're doing this, focus on that. Maybe it will help. Trust me, I've been through worse. No, you haven't. All the things in your life. Knowing that the woman you loved was hunted down. I can make all this go away. I'm putting together a special team. With special powers. Join me, but you will have your revenge. Mutants. I don't hate them. They must be controlled. Locked out! Well, well, well. Look what the cat dragged in. Don't worry, we'll stop him. You just spent half a billion dollars making him indestructible. It's not the young mutant you've been looking for. the only piece of this puzzle. Hunt him down. We all got a choice, son. Now mine got taken. That will never happen again. We can't just let you walk away. So X-Men Origins Wolverine came out around 2009 and about that period we just got a, a much more not say retrospective look on superhero properties because a year before that we got Iron Man The Incredible Hulk at the time people just saw them as regular standard movies while some people didn't realize that this was all going to be a setup leading to the Avengers and X-Men was out there doing fine even though they had a little bit of a misstep with the last stand with critics and audiences alike they had tried to do something different and try to revamp the movies into an x-men origin series showing the origin stories of certain different types of x-men and they decided to go with their most popular one at the time wolverine still played by hugh jackman and if i'm gonna be honest this movie i wasn't too into the movie as much where i saw the game the game trailer that popped up during my local Sears. Whenever I saw that trailer, I'm like, okay, X-Men Origins Wolverine, the game. I'm going to be excited for it because the game was cool. But then again, I got to realize that movie games, or should I say movies based off a of video game, video games based off of movies don't always work out the same way. Like sometimes the game adaptation is a bit more different than the movie. But I'm like, eh, it doesn't matter. I feel like the same way I play the game is going to be the same way I play it or the same way I watch it as in the movie. And no, none of that happened. If I'm going to be honest with you, there's been a lot said about X-Men Origins Wolverine. But I'll just say that, as a kid, I didn't like it as much. Like, I'm like, okay, it's cool. Wolverine is cool. There are certain fight sequences. I'm like, okay, I'm going to rewatch it for that. And there are some good moments in this movie. Which, I'm going to just get into some of the good on this one. I'm going to be honest. Even though this movie w is not good, Hugh Jackman still kills that as Wolverine. Say what you will about this movie. He's still good as Wolverine, and even though there are some little things or at least plot changes they do to the Weapon X thing, I'm like, okay, at least I could say he still is on to shine. Like, this isn't just being phoned in. And I'm not gonna lie, there are some additions in this movie. I feel like if they were in the other X Men movies, people would find it a little bit more controversial knowing that this isn't how it's supposed to be. But Sabretooth being um, Logan's brother, that one I felt like, okay, that's a change. 
But I don't think it's going to be a big deal because at least we're going to see them be enemies. And they were. They were brothers at first. And then sooner or later, each of them went through different paths. Even the way they were raised as kids because um, the origin story they put up as in the beginning. Seeing where you see that Logan as a kid is unveiling his mutant powers. He's getting the claws. And he kills his own dad. And you're seeing this though, just like in the comic. You see Wolverine kill his dad. And you see the neglect he has that... Oh, I didn't realize that the father I was that was taking care of me all my life was this other person, and some and my real father killed this guy. So I'm like conflicted, and he just runs off and does his own thing. And with Sabretooth by his side, I'm like, okay, Lee Schreiber as Sabretooth, it's weird. I don't see him more as like a buff, muscular, or at least action type of person because uh, around this time too, um, me and my brother watched Scream, and when we saw that Sabretooth was cotton weary. I was like, really? That's going to be weird because I feel like I, I can't even see like that character every time I look at Sabretooth in this movie. But still, he was all right. He was a good okay Sabretooth. Yeah, he didn't have the big tiger mane or he at least didn't wear the orange overcoat and everything like that. The claws, they look cool and also, like I said, experimental for this time because they still try doing different formats of adapting these characters. Like in the first X-Men, you saw comic accurate Sabretooth, Toad, even Magneto in this movie... They were experimental with their superhero ideas, but there are some I'm like, okay, you zigged, but then you zagged. Some of them are interesting, and some people are like, okay, I don't know what these characters, but at least the powers they're showing off are cool. It's like, there are a couple of mutants in this movie. I'm like, okay, that's cool that you got them in this, but I don't feel like, even though you included some of these mutants here, it doesn't seem like you could have at least adapted certain elements from their comic counterparts. Because this movie feels more bland, like it's just a movie with Wolverine, but you're not getting any of the fantasy fantasy elements that were introduced in the other X-Men movies. Like, mutants exist. But in this time period, even though I know it's around the 80s, it's more capable of saying that, okay, at this time period, not everybody knows about mutants. But then again, as the X-Men timeline gets more and more forward, some of this is going to be a bit confusing, but for some of the mutants he actually introduced in this movie... I actually kind of appreciate the fact that, one, we got um, Sabretooth, but also the fact that they also introduced um, certain other characters. I'm going to just name them from their actors because I feel like I can't remember their names as I'm doing this, even though I watched it. Like, Will I Am as, um, as Wrath. I know he is a cool character, but also the fact that I like that his signature thing was the Nightwalker, te- um, Nightwalker, Nightcrawler teleporting factor that he can just teleport whatever time he wants. And yes, it's not the first time you see a teleporting character, even though Nightcrawler was there. But he wanted to play a character that was like similar to Nightcrawler, and I did kind of like that. Saber, Silver Fox as um, Logan's girlfriend, but also Striker's lackey. I feel like it's kind of weird, the fact that I know that her power is basically like telling people what to do. is more like, hip- I wouldn't say it's hypnosis. But it's more like the fact that she can control anybody she wants just by touching them. And it's kind of funny the fact that with this character, it's one of the ones where I'm like, okay, early 2000s. I feel like we can't just adapt them exactly how they are. Because in the comics, I know she's been Native American. But it's kind of funny in the fact that, okay, they got these characters that is also part of Hydra. That at first, watching as a kid, I'm like, eh, that's nothing. But then reading more on the history, I'm like, hmm... They really wanted to do some crossover if they were going to decide on doing this. I found out, like, okay, she works the Hydra and Captain America is one of the future Avengers coming. Doesn't that mean they could also lead it in? But childhood mind aside, I'm like, eh. Yeah, they did what they did. But she was kind of bland as the girlfriend, knowing that she would play a role. The fact that to get Wolverine back into the Weapon X program, he could at least fake her death from Sabretooth. But then also the fact that she comes alive at the very end is like, your purpose was just nothing here, and yeah, that's fine. Some other ones, I'm kind of funny, the fact that I'm like, at least they introduced these characters well, where these two specifically, I'm like, okay, out of everything, the whole X-Men movie timeline is done, at least whenever they try to introduce some new mutants you haven't seen yet, at least they try to treat them with a bit of respect. Like, um, one of the ones, I'm going to get up for out the great, is um the Blob, because it's funny how back then I'm like, I didn't even realize that that character was supposed to be the Blob at the beginning. Because um, you see um, Kevin Durant eating in the beginning, his character, he's, he's like, okay, just eating candy. But then when you see him later on in the movie, it's like, oh, so he actually was the blob this whole time? And I didn't realize that, even though that little foreshadow was kind of on the nose. 
And yeah, it's kind of funny the fact that, okay, we get to see the blob in this movie. He doesn't get to wear the suit, but at least it's more on the fact that, okay, we're seeing little pieces of new mutants being introduced. And yeah, they look accurate for the time. But a couple of years later, I found out that, um, yeah, he was just some guy who ate himself to being that big and is not basically like a power. Like, the Blob's um, power is the fact that he can be as big as he wants, but he's still indestructible. But in this movie, it was like, oh, he doesn't have any powers at all, that he's just ate himself to death. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's... I didn't want to know that, but Headcanon is not going to change that. And another mutant they actually introduced, which... I wondered what it would have been like if he was introduced earlier on in the main X-Men movies, if they were actually trying to adapt it right. Was Taylor Kitsch as Remy LeBeau, or should I say Gambit, which Taylor Kitsch was everywhere or trying to be a big thing in late or late 2000s to early 2010s. But as Gambit, re-watching it, I'm like, this dude was perfect as Gambit. Not only the fact that, yeah, most people don't always realize that he's in these movies, like... I know we wanted Gambit in a movie for sure, but him being here, it's like, okay, it's it's Gambit, the character, but also the fact that, yeah, he does the whole throwing cards bit, he has the staff, he doesn't wear the suit, he wears a bit of hint of purple in his casino clothes, but his character in this movie is like, yeah, he only has like around maybe two scenes in the movie when he meets up with Wolverine to find information about Sabretooth, and at the very end, when he comes over to help and find Logan. I kind of like the fact that it at least kept him accurate to what he was. Yeah, he has the accent. But my thing is that even though he is powerful enough in the movie, it's the fact that they didn't use him as much as he could have. Because I know we don't have Wolverine interacting with anybody around this whole thing. Yeah, he gets his little moments with Sabretooth, but it's more like the fact that we could have had Logan with a sidekick. Or at least somebody who's like, oh, not all mutants are bad, or at least there are some out there who could at least be on my side. But I'm like, eh. For as much as we had Gambit in this movie, I'm like, at least he was the best part of the movie. He's one I say, if they could have brought him back in another X-Men movie, or at least a, another timeline by any chance, it would have been cool to at least see a reintroduction, but I don't know, some, I wouldn't say some, but there's some word on the street that something like that could happen on July 26th. Don't know what exactly, but hopefully that one turns out being true. And lastly, I gotta talk about the main man himself, Ryan Reynolds. As Wade Wilson, Deadpool, but not really Deadpool, and also Weapon 11. Because it's funny that, um, I know this, that early on when they started doing these Marvel movies, that me and my brother, we would always look at the cartoons, we'd watch the animations, even on YouTube whenever they did some Lego stuff. But I remember back when the Hulk vs. Um, animated movie came out, and we saw the Hulk fighting Wolverine, we saw uh, Sabretooth, Omega Red... <laughs> Lady Deathstrike and we saw one little comedic character by the name of Deadpool and it's funny because as a kid I'm like hearing the names Wade Wade and I'm like okay I know the characters but I don't, I don't think they remember hearing them say Wilson and then rewatching it and hearing that Ryan Reynolds did play Deadpool I'm like that's not a bad choice and it's funny because I know him from with this sarcastic type of humor it's like okay I get that but I don't know it's kind of weird that they had Deadpool but not do Deadpool, you know what I mean? Because, yeah, you could say X-Men is exaggerated, but the same way a character like this would fit into this world, and not only that, but I feel like it was the whole PG-13 element of it that they couldn't do everything exactly, because, yeah, we had a comedic character like Spider-Man do his thing, but also having another character in the X-Men universe that looks similar to Spider-Man, but with swords and guns and people thought, okay, that type of edge could be translated, but it can't just yet because we don't know if people are ready for it. It's the thing that, yeah, in a PC-13 format, they could have done it, but it's more the fact that they wanted to test ground this character and see how he would do with audiences, where Ryan Reynolds said, oh, I could get a, I could get the chance to play Wade Wilson. Not realizing that, okay, this is going to be a starter for Wade Wilson, and sooner or later, he was going to get a Deadpool movie made, right? And no, that didn't end up happening at the time because Ryan Reynolds was just playing Wade Wilson and just as Weapon 11 where, yeah, that whole thing with the bald face, stitched up mouth, pecs, and the Baraka swords. It's kind of the fact that, okay, this is weird. If this was a different character in X-Men lore, like let's say put characters aside or just say, okay, even though this is a Wolverine Origins movie, let's say replace this character with somebody like... I don't know, 
Talon, that would have been cool up to the fact that I was like, oh, it's another character, but it's not Wolverine, but he looks like Wolverine has the same type of power set. And yes, I know that um, Talon is Wolverine's son. I keep forgetting, is it Talon or Dakin? One of the two. Like, uh, I hate these moments when I'm fixing up more messing up my Marvel than DC names. But yeah, let's say he, Wolverine did fight his son. And with the same power set, it's like, okay, we have somebody similar. So like that, whenever we get to a, a new fight in the future, we're like, okay, we've seen that. We have to go through all that stress and trouble. So like that, when we see him in the current movies, it's like, damn, he went through all that struggle. I feel the story since I've lived through the story and I watched the story. But yeah, let me just give out my thoughts on this. The last couple things I want to get through are some of the bad things in this. Because you could say that this movie was bad or it wasn't meant to be bad, but there could have been a better version of this movie out there that could have been made but my thing is that this was and i didn't even realize this until later on where this movie was actually one of the victims of the writer strike that happened around 2008 2009 because i don't know what exactly happened at that one specifically i feel like i should know but it's kind of weird that the fact that this also happened again last year in 2023 where the fact that the writer strike had a thing where oh Writers need to get paid. People need to get compens compensated for their stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you should. And I realized that was a thing back in around 2008, 2009. And that kind of does explain um, X-Men Origins Wolverine. The fact that who knows if this would have been a better version of people paid their writers or something going on in between studios. And the fact that also that Transformers um, Revenge of the Fallen did come out that same year. And that was another victim of it. But... It wasn't really, though, if we're going to be honest with you. I don't even know if it was, but... Yeah, I don't know if there could have been a better version of Revenge of the Fallen as it was now. But getting back to this, some of the things is that... So there are certain CGI moments, mainly the claws and some of the explosions... And de-aging stuff that I'm like, okay... Doing this in an earlier X-Men movie is kind of funny. The fact that they tried doing that for X, um, The Last Stand... With um Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen, but it looked weird and... A bit more video gamey. The fact that yeah, they could have just used themselves, but it's kind of weird. Same thing with some of the claw animation in this movie because it's kind of weird that Wolverine's claws were shiny and a bit more practical in the last couple of movies, but in this one, some scenes were CGI and some of them were just weirdly cartoonish where the claws were too white and they would just slash slash like nothing. Like they would just slash like you were cut through something, and it wouldn't sound like actual metal. It'd just be like the same sound effect. Even though this was made after those movies, I don't know. I don't even know if there was a bit of studio meddling, but who knows. For what I know, this movie, as a movie itself, it, it wasn't a good origin story. It's not one of the better X-Men movies. And the fact that it's like, okay, you tainted the X-Men movies twice in a row at this point. It's like, yeah, Sony finished off their Spider-Man trilogy at this point. Fantastic Four, you kind of did it ruin it with the second one in our eyes and i feel like marvel studios is going to do something different once they introduce the avengers they got iron man right they got the hulk right but hopefully their next movie at least could try to impress us and they kind of did because x-men was still doing the thing where it's like okay we'll wait out wait out a couple of years and we're still going to do the origins thing and they wanted to do an x-men origins movie but in this one they said you know what we'd rather go we were going to go in one direction, but I feel like if we're going to tell the story right, we got to go back from the very beginning. And we can't include an origin story without these two benefiting what could be our new timeline and a new, let's say, reboot for the franchise. Because after X-Men Origins Wolverine, we didn't know if the X-Men movies were going to be continuing. So they were going to keep going and we were going to start off fresh with X-Men First Class. of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. The cost of freedom is always high. 
No one can foresee precisely what course it will take. One path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender. You ready for this? Let's find out. Listen to me very carefully, my friend. Killing will not bring you peace. Peace was never an option. X-Men First Class was a bit of a reset for the X-Men timeline. Not only the fact that even though the movie itself says it's a prequel to the first movie, it is, technically, but also the fact that this movie actually stars new actors portraying um, Charles Xavier and Eric Lyncher, with James McAvoy playing Professor X, and um, the fact that it's funny, the fact that I've seen him in other stuff, but... I didn't see him as Magneto when I first saw him because Michael Fassbender, when I first seen him in a movie, I feel like, okay, I've seen him in Inglorious Bastards. So you're telling me that he's going to be Magneto? That's kind of, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny itself, but then I'm like, okay, let's see how that one works. And yeah, both of them nailed their roles in this movie because I feel like the fact that this was the starting ground of what could have been a bad movie with X-Men Origins because I feel like everybody dropped X-Men at this point. It was around 2011. We just got Thor. We just got Captain America. And X-Men is the only other movie in between before Spider-Man's getting rebooted again. And I feel like, okay, this is their one shot. They could try to do it right. And they did. With Matthew Vaughn directing this and also the fact that, yes, we're going to go back a bit before the X-Men actually introduced itself with the whole 1960s Cuban Missile Crisis event and the fact that also that a lot of things were introduced in this movie the fact that okay we're going to be doing this in this same world but all the things we're going to be doing in here is going to be a bit more comic booky because everything in this movie itself not only feels like a serious like you know comic book movie but also a bit of in the fantasy because we get to see a bit more characters being introduced we got a couple more new mutants and some returning mutants like Mystique and also Beast, because I know there are some characters that are like, yeah, we saw them in the last couple of movies, but we don't know how exactly can they fit in, because timeline aside, this takes place in the 60s, and once we get into X-Men in the early 2000s, it's like, shouldn't these guys be around in their 60s, timeline-wise, or at least, you know? And they kind of did explain it here, where they didn't explain it as much. I feel like in X-Men, they should have explained it, at least in one of these movies, that the mutant X gene doesn't just affect your powers, but it also affects your body that is going to have you age slowly over time, but not everybody's going to live, not everybody's going to die. You'll still age, but it's more like you'll be younger than what people usually expect you to be. But in this, ignoring all that aside, I'm going to just get into this. First Class feels like a bit of a refresher for the X-Men franchise. Even though it is part of the same franchise, this movie feels like it's in the same world, but at least it's fixing some of the bad and putting in some of the good showing, some of the relationships with Professor X and Magneto. Even though some shots are recreated from the first X-Men movie showing off Magneto and his powers, I feel like this was more of an X-Men Origins Magneto movie because Charles, he's in it, but I feel like it's not about Charles Xavier as much as more as Magneto because you know Magneto's the villain, and yes, you know he's been through a lot. And even though Professor X, as we see him, is he's the one who's actually going to try to at least bring peace between the people and mutants. Magneto just wants revenge, he wants anger. He wants everything to go to his will because everything was taken away from him as a child. Even though the movies went, touched it, but they didn't show it as much as it was here because you got to remember, part of Magneto's origin is that he was a part of the Holocaust and his family was taken away, killed, and once people saw that his powers were unveiling and they could actually use him for something, they're like, oh, we can actually use this kid and actually bring out our power between this the war because, you know, Nazis and shit. But I feel like in this, you get to see more of Magneto's side. I'm like, okay, we get to see more of him. Yeah, he's not wrong, 
But then again, when you look at Charles, it's like, yeah, I get that you want to help this person. He's your best friend. But at some point, you got to realize that some people can't be saved. Not There's not a lot of good between all these people. Not only the fact that Charles, played by James McAvoy, is kind of funny in this movie because he's smart, but it's more the fact that he plays off being smart as like, not almost as a narcissistic degree because yes, he's there to help mutants and he's like, oh, I'm not the only one out there. And I feel like, yeah, I could actually form a, a school together and actually have these people rehabilitate or at least be part of society. And it's like, okay, you, I get that. But more of Eric's side in this is like, yeah, but then again, he wants mutants to actually sh- give up their powers and not just be afraid so a lot of people can say, oh, they're freaks. More of this fact that I know that first class doesn't do a lot is that first class does a thing where, yeah, we'll introduce a couple of mutants and some of the villains are going to be a bit more comic bookish, but at least this kept it to the core where some of the other X-Men movies were more realistic and let's say they were edgy with the suits where we just saw more most of the characters were black leather and sometimes wore clothes referencing their colors. Like we've seen Wolverine wear a tank top for four straight movies, but we're not going to question the fact that, okay, at least at some point he's going to have to wear that suit. And if not, I feel like every time we're going to see him in a fight, it's always going to be this. In in first class, they actually found a way to p- include, let's say, I think it was the Astonishing X-Men colors where they wore jumpsuits. They're like, okay, this is more like flight suits when they get into the, to the Blackbird. But their X-suits were more like parachute glider suits where it was black on the outsides but yellow on the insides, almost referencing the black suits with the X in the middle. I'm like, okay, that's a nice finishing touch. But not only that, is that most of the action in this movie, I feel like compared to the other two, yeah, we technology has advanced a bit. But the fact that we're seeing actual one-on-one combat and powers being used in the mix, it's kind of cool because we have seen it before. But it's the fact that they're exploiting the powers in this. We get to see Mystique do her thing. We get to see a bit more of the physics side with Magneto whenever he uses magnetism. Even the fact that there's some characters in Judas like Banshee, ha- Havoc, Darwin, which... It's a cool power, but I'm like, damn, they killed you off too early. Angel, Azazel. A lot of these characters in Judas here are cool. And it's funny the fact that even um, Emma Frost, who doesn't get a lot to do in this movie, her design and texture is like we're seeing through actual diamonds. And X-Men Origins came out like, what was it, two years before this? And they introduced her in that and it looked like ice. Okay, I get a bit of the improvements here. Thank you for that. But yeah, everything in this movie felt a bit more unique to its time. Yes, it's a bit of an improvement and a good start for the franchise, but my thing is that, okay, we're doing the origins thing again. Yes, we're going to have to get used to these characters and their introductions now that the fact that, okay, all this is in a new timeline, all this is going to be resetting. Hopefully, what the next movie you guys do is going to be something great. And it's not great. It's more of the fact that, okay, we get what the movies are looking like for X-Men right now, but I don't think anything is going to be as good as it was the first time going around but i feel like people had their doubts with this one but personally i did like this a bit more than i feel like the entire general audience of x-men actually liked this one i've been trying to find you for over a year it's an honor to meet the wolverine that's not who i am anymore many years I have wanted to thank you for saving my life but I didn't send for you only to thank you Logan I wanted to repay you a gift to equal the life you gave me you have struggled long enough I can end your eternity make you mortal. What they did to me, what I am, can't be undone. Don't be so sure.
The Wolverine, directed by James Mangold. I gotta say, for the time it was, it was 2013 when this was released. A lot of Marvel movies have been released around this time. We just got the Avengers released. We got the Amazing Spider-Man. We had the Dark Knight Rises end and Man of Steel just getting ready to soar off. But the Wolverine is one I feel like, yeah, a lot of people mostly forget about this movie most of the time. I feel like when I mention the Wolverine, they're like, oh yeah, that one, the one where he goes to Japan. I'm like, e really? That's all you got to say for it? You got to admit it was cool though, because yeah, we get Hugh Jackman coming back as Wolverine. This takes place after The Last Stand, which I remember people making it a big deal. We're like, oh wait, we're getting another in the future Wolverine sequel. Like this is a sequel to The Last Stand. Oh shit. But then again, a lot of people weren't going to dig it because they're like, eh, X-Men Origins kind of really messed it up for Wolverine for me. I don't feel like it's cool seeing another movie. But nah, this movie was actually a bit more enjoyable than Origins. Not only are we getting Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine and at his most buffest state in this movie because, man, there are a lot of scenes with him in this where I'm like, shit, Wolverine is like, god damn, he's buff for no reason. And it's funny because the most of the regiment we started hearing now about Hugh Jackman that he had to take like ice baths, eat boiled chickens for his diet. I'm like, God damn, that's like, is that good? He even said it's not good himself, but to get that buff for it, that's the the most he got for playing Wolverine. And I'm like, shit, and it shows. Most of this movie is a bit more, let's say, edgy and dark. I don't even know if it was because of the period that we were in. I feel like around the early 2010s that most of our comic book stuff started getting dark and look a bit more edgy, like with muted colors and stuff like that. But with the Wolverine and the tone they were going for in this movie, I'm like, okay, I dig it with this. And the aesthetic of moving him from the actual stage to Japan, because yeah, we get the whole beginning showing the bomb. Um, we see everything from there to him going back as, oh, I left. And I feel like after the death of Jean and Charles and Scott, I feel like I'm nothing anymore. I'm just out there, you know, the wanderer just going around. And I feel like bringing him back into the fold, him seeing that he doesn't want to live as Wolverine anymore. He doesn't want the immortality. He just wants to take it out of him. Nobody can live a life like this. And in this movie, it does, which is the first time we've seen Wolverine without his healing factor. And... It's kind of cool seeing because I feel like I don't even know if I have seen it in any other entertainment besides this because I feel like we've seen Wolverine be weak. We've seen him be defeated, but and we've seen, you know, Magneto rip him apart in the comics. But I'm like, I feel like this is the first time we've seen like a mortal Wolverine on screen it, and looking at it like that is like we can see him get shot and bullets start coming out of him. We see him actually get hurt. His anger every time he pulls out those claws, you're going to see a little bit more blood. And we've seen, the first time we've actually seen blood on claws because I don't know if it was James Mangold or the style they were going for for this movie, but I feel like this movie was meant to be rated R, but the studio said, oh no, we got to make it PG-13 because it's not a big thing yet. We don't want to risk this being an R rating, but there are some scenes with Wolverine and his claws with blood in this movie. Where I'm like, okay, those shots look cool. We're seeing people being mutilated, ripped apart, stabbed. I'm like, okay, every hit you feel in this is real. And this is a lot more stronger than what we usually see since every time we're going to see Wolverine in a fight, we know he's going to heal back. We know he's going to come back strong. But in this, I'm like, we felt him at his most mortal state. It's like, damn, it's not even cool anymore. It hurts. Even the fact that, yeah, some of the action sequences are cool in this movie. This one feels a bit more longer than usual. I know it's around like two hours and 17 something minutes, but I feel like there was a lot going on in this movie. And I feel like there are a lot of key characters like... They made it seem like they were important, but I feel like they didn't benefit anything to this just yet. Because I know it's because of um, Viper introducing this movie that she gets the healing factor removed, or at least poisons Wolverine, and at least injects a little bug in him to make him lose his healing factor. I'm like, yeah, but besides that, she doesn't really do anything. Yeah, she gets one of the guys to actually go up and assassinate Wolverine, but at least that doesn't end up happening. And she ends up getting choked out by... Um, the guy's daughter anyway so i feel like that's not too big and also introducing us to and it's funny because they there's actually two versions of this character yukio but in the, i can't remember exactly what it was i feel like i, I get a girl powers confused i don't even know if i am but she had the power to actually look into the future and see who would die and how exactly they would die i'm like okay that's cool and at least brings a little bit of attention because she keeps telling logan oh i've seen you die yeah, on this plane? No, not really.
later. And it's like, huh, that's kind of weird, putting some stakes in this. Even the fact that she did kind of bring a little bit of human to Wolverine because she she's the one that actually saw the pictures or at least found um, Logan's profile, at least see little bits of him from the other X-Men movies because you see a little Easter egg of him with Storm at the very end of, or should I say the beginning of, of The Last Stand when he were looking for Scott. But besides that, I feel like she could have been, she was a good sidekick to Wolverine. It's just the fact that she, she's there for the fights, but isn't always around during those fights with Logan is doing his thing. Cause I'm like, that's a good team up combo. Yeah, we don't get Lady Deathstrike in this, but eh, this is a good combo nonetheless. But yeah, one thing I'm always getting to, and I feel like they shouldn't have done this, but would have been a good rematch or at least a good match is the fact that Silver Samurai is in this movie, but he's more of a cyborg instead of an actual person in armor, which yeah, it would have been cool to see the Silver Samurai armor and the fact that we're in Japan is a good aesthetic because we could have gotten a good sword on claws fight now that Wolverine has his powers back. But yeah, Silver Samurai ends up being the old guy who he saved at the beginning of the bomb. But I feel like, yeah, I feel like everybody knows his name as Death 101 where if you haven't seen the body, you know they're not dead and if they show the body and they are dead, I'm like, okay, I see it. And yeah, that wasn't too big of a reveal and a lot of people knew that going into the movie halfway through. But I feel like, yeah, the Wolverine as a movie, it's okay at best. It's, at least it's a good Wolverine movie. It's not as bad as X-Men Origins. But yeah, we're kind of seeing this that, okay, all these X-Men movies, they're average for now. Yeah, they got Wolverine, right? Wolf Hugh Jackman is still good as Wolverine to this day. And it's like, okay, we got everything here. And this, not, not gonna lie, people thought, okay, this ain't nothing. This is another X-Men movie. And it's kind of my fault because I didn't realize this. But back in 2013, right when the movie had said directed by James Mangold, me, my dad, and my brother, we left the theater and we're just going home. I'm like, okay, a couple days later go by and I'm like, there was a post credit scene showing Professor X and Magneto and Wolverine. I'm like, wait, what? And that actually brought me to tears because I'm like, wait a minute, what? And I find early on YouTube before YouTube started copywriting all their videos and before the early TikToks when they started showing stuff and leaks. YouTubers actually started making videos and actually showing video footage of the post credit scene showing Wolverine going past a metal detector. You see Magneto right behind him. He's like, there's a war coming. He's like, why should I trust you? You wouldn't. And in the back, what do you hear? You hear somebody rolling in and it's Professor X, Patrick Stewart himself. And it's like, oh, what? And you see, he's like, Charles. And like... Logan's like oh my god like well, Logan's like really Charles you're here how is this possible and Professor X responds as I told you a long time ago you're not the only one with gifts and this brought back excitement to him like oh so we're gonna get another X-Men movie and this is gonna explain what's going on how is Professor X still alive how does Magneto have his powers back since at the very end of the last end you did kind of see him move that little uh, chess piece but it's like, okay, what are the X-Men movies leading to now? Because Wolverine was announced, or should I say announced, Wolverine came out in 2013, and later that summer, Comic-Con hit, and 20th Century Fox was coming back with a bang, because they already announced their next X-Men movie in development, which, not gonna lie, it doesn't follow the story, but then again, it's like, no, we know we're not gonna follow the story, but no, this is a more of a... I'm sorry, in a big, we believe in you guys and thank you guys for sticking with us this long because this is a big apology to the fans and X-Men Days of Future Past was really something when it came out back in 2014. What's the last thing you remember? into the past. You're going to have to do for me what I once did for you. You'll need me as well. Side by side to end this war. Before it ever begins. 
So I wake up in my younger body and then what? Find me. Convince me of all of this. It's going to take the two of us. And where do I find you? A different path. A darker path. Logan, I was a very different man. Lead me. Guide me. Be patient with me. We need you to hope again. Days of Future Past, for what I can say on the movie side, yeah, it doesn't follow the actual comic translation, and it's one of the ones I feel like at the time, there were a lot of people I knew who were like, oh, it's Days of Future Past, but it's with the first class cast, it's not, it has the characters, but it's not following the right characters, I'm like, okay, suddenly I feel like y'all yeah, yeah, going for this a bit too, too hard, because I remember my uh, one of my art teachers at the time was like, oh, because we were talking about all these Marvel movies and stuff that was just announced. And we're like, oh, they're doing Days of Future Past, but it's going to be with the first class people. It's not going to be just like in the comics. And I'm like, yeah, I get him because the comic version is kind of cool where you see all mutants dead in the future. And you're seeing everybody like, oh, we got to go back and find a way to fix all this. And Bishop goes back in time to fix it in the animation. But in the comics, it's actually Kitty Pride that they send back in time. And we're going to see the story go through her eyes. But I'm like, yeah, you have the characters, but it's like... Yeah, if you put that aside and follow the characters in this version of the story as the movie is showing, you can't lie and say that this ain't a good version or at least good story that they're trying to do to tight all loose ends and actually put things back the way they were. Because Daisy Future Past, what I can say, is a big return to the X-Men franchise because, yeah, you get all the returning characters from both the original and first class cast, but also Brian Singer back at the helm of this. You get to see everything as it was after X-Men, The Last Stand, and The Wolverine, and First Class, where every, it takes place later in the future, let's say around 20... I don't want to even say if, if it's the dystopian t- future of 2029, but um, yeah, all mutants are being hunted down, Sentinels are running the place, and to go back, the only way to fix this is to go back in time and fix everything, where Mystique in the past doesn't have to assassinate the president leading to the Sentinels being created, so they gotta send Wolverine, still played by Hugh Jackman, into the past so like that could at least meet up with young charles and young eric so at least they could try to prevent this from happening so my thing is that with this movie being the biggest apology to these x-men movies and as a whole is the fact that okay we know they messed up we know with every other movie it's like yeah the x-men haven't been done since brian singer had these guys so it's like okay let's bring him back let's at least hear him out and hear his story pitches so like that we can try at least get this right and yeah, for what I can say, out of all the X-Men movies as a whole, this is one of the best ones in the series. I'd say top three, or at least in the top five to be exact. But yeah, as an X-Men movie itself, it's like, yeah, we fixed everything they could. And they tied up all loose ends, but at least left it more open. So it's like, okay, if you weren't disappointed at this, at least we're going to acknowledge it later on in this movie. Because if I'm going to say something before I get into this is where the theatrical cut is okay, it's nice, and yeah, that's the version I saw first, but I feel like they did us dirty because <laughs> when this got released on digital, they had a second version called The Row Cut, an extended version of this movie, which, if I'm going to be honest, if you haven't seen Days of Future Past at this point, and yes, it's been 10 years, go watch The Row Cut, because if you watch The Row Cut first, that is the whole movie in its entirety, and you get to see a little bit more characters, because yeah, we get characters like Wolverine, Charles, Eric, um... Storm coming back, even though we only see her in the future. Bishop, Iceman, Kitty Pride, Blink, Sunspot. And it's funny the fact that Colossus is in these movies, but then again, he's not a big character for the most part. He's just there. But it's like, damn, I wish you were in these more. But in the next one, we get to see a lot more of him, so stay tuned for that. But in this, like I say, at least you got your good assortment of futures for the future. At least finding a way to at least make the story work. Because there are some things I'm like, if you ignore the characters themselves and say they can do this, it's cool. Like Kitty Pryde sending Wolverine back in time. Because it's like, you can teleport through walls and somehow send people back in time. That power combo just doesn't mix. But yeah, the whole thing with um, Wolverine going back to the past. And yes, it's Wolverine before the Weapon X program. We get to see him reconnect with Charles 
the fact that in this version that Charles, after first class, is like he lost Mystique, he lost Eric. He became more of a low life, like a junkie, always waiting to s strap up so like that he can lose the his powers because he uses a serum that actually takes away his powers and it's like, I don't want to be Charles, I don't want to be this big thing because I failed. And it's like, Wolverine's like, man, you gotta at least fix yourself because this is gonna happen in the future and if you don't trust me, you might as well just let this happen because Mystique is gonna die soon. Not only that, but also the fact that to get Mystique out of trouble, they're gonna have to go through Magneto and to get Magneto, you have to go through one of the best characters in this movie by far, which was Quicksilver. And the fact that I was like, okay, Quicksilver is going to be in this, but then again, he's going to be in Age of Ultron. So it's like, eh, I don't see how this is going to work. But looking at Quicksilver in Days of Future Past, he stole the show with the super speed. Evan Peters doing his thing. And it's kind of funny the fact that his version wasn't like fast to be fast, but it's more the fact that in the physics of, okay, I'm a fast character. You're going to at least acknowledge this. Everything I'm going to do is going to comedic and slow. So like that, we're gonna get some cool sequences out of it, and we kind of did it too. Like the scene where he breaks into the prison, the fact that yes, he's gonna get have to go through the thing to get Magneto phase through and actually tie up some of the security guards, but also the scene where in the kitchen where uh, Wolverine and Charles go down to find Magneto, we see all these cops with uh, glass guns because Magneto, and once he, Magneto starts controlling some of the dishes and pots and stuff. They all shoot, and you see Quicksilver speed up, and you see him put his goggles, move all the bullets out of the way, and the, also maneuver some of the security guards, punch them in the face, so like that. Once it gets back to normal CP, the room clears out. It's funny seeing that, and then they just leave him beside, and it's like, oh, we don't need him for the rest of the movie, because it'd be kind of cool if he was around, but okay, I see why you let, let him go. Too easy. Even the little Easter egg, he's like, looks at Magneto in the yellow, and he's like, you can control metal. My mom knew a guy who can do that, which is like, ooh, that's his son, that's his dad, he doesn't know it yet. Oh, man, I can't wait for that reveal. So, like that, Wolverine and everybody, they got Magneto, they're gonna go over to the White House, or at least try to acknowledge everything that's been going on with Mystique, trying to assassinate him, and the creation of the Sentinels, because they gotta remember that in this version of the X-Men timeline, okay, after first class, they saw that, okay, mutants are out there, we're gonna have to go through this real quick. We need something to at least experiment on them or at least exterminate them so we know who's in control here. And Bulbar Trust actually created the Sentinels, actually finding a way to confine mutants. The fact that he is played by a different actor, and it's funny that it's Peter Dinklage, but the fact that the character is still the character in the original movies, it's like, huh, timelines. But um, yeah, Mystique finds a way to get close to Trash, tries to kill him. But the fact that when um, Mystique gets shot by Magneto and a bit of the blood is found on the outside of Paris, it's funny the fact that because of Magneto, the timeline or what could have been the end of the movie, which if, Mag if Mystique stopped um, killing Trask, the fact that, yes, that would have at least acknowledged the fact that, okay, if Mystique doesn't kill Trask, then the Sentinels won't be created in the future and they'll put a stop to this. The fact that Magneto stalled it so like that, he would shoot Mystique, weaken Mystique, and once her blood got on the pavement and the scientists found that it's like, okay, she didn't have to kill Trask, but then again, it's that anomaly of time travel, or at least in these time travel movies where just because you did the thing doesn't mean later on that same sequence of events is going to happen. Like, the Sentinels are still going to be created either way after you just did this because they got Mystique's blood and they saw that, oh, we can adapt the Sentinels to finding mutants. And who knows if, because of this genetic gene specifically, it could be adapt to any other mutant ability. So it's like, oh, either way, they still found a way to say, oh, you can't prevent the future because the future is still going to happen and you're screwed. A later scene describes it with um, Hank McCoy explains it to Wolverine and Charles in an episode of Star Trek in the background. Where it's like, okay, so all this is going to happen either way and the only way this is going to be stopped is if we stop Magneto. And that's the only way we can actually get the suit because Magneto's on his way to assassinate the president and the fact that he tampered with the Sentinels, having them in his control is like, oh, all this is going to have people be aware of mutants. And anytime they're going to think about mutants, they're like, oh no, bad. All mutants are bad. And these Sentinels are still going to be used either way. So yeah, later on um, in the future, <laughs> later on in the future, in the future, we see everything happening in current time. Like everything in the future is still happening as it goes. And let's say... <laughs> This was my Avengers Infinity War moment where 
We have people, Marvel fans of today, freaking out in Infinity War when somebody dies or an endgame when Tony Stark got killed. We didn't experience real shock until the end of Days to Future Past, where we see all the Sentinels finding their last location. They're being tracked. They know where they are. All the X-Men, surviving X-Men at least, at least try to fight out the Sentinels. Magneto finds a way to at least stop them. But in the meanwhile, gets stabbed. Then it's like, oh shit, Magneto got stabbed. And a Sentinel comes over and kills Storm. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, yep. Oh my God. The look on my face seeing some of my favorite characters die is like, shit, they're getting fucked up. And the future has to be saved. Come on. I know it is, but it's like, God damn, because we see Storm get stabbed and thrown off a cliff. Colossus ripped in half. Fire. Oh my God. Sunspot being burnt. It's like, damn, they suck. Fuck the Sentinels, man. It's, it hurts. And in current, in the past, we see Wolverine trying to fight off Magneto. Charles at least trying to use his powers, but he's still weak. And he couldn't even um, get close to him. We see Wolverine at least try to fight Magneto without, without Metal Claws this time. And even though he had Bone Claws, he wasn't still a match because Magneto found a way to at least strap some metal strapnel inside of Wolverine. He's like, huh. So good luck being the only survivor of the future sends him off and throws him in a lake and it's like damn the future cannot be saved and it's not up until Mystique actually got her way inside of the vault of the White House and she was gonna kill Trash but she found a way to transform into the president actually confront Magneto get a shot at him so like that it's like okay this is my decision and if it's not if, and if it wasn't for Charles in her head at the moment her putting down that gun would have saved everybody in the future because everybody was all the sentinels were already inside the little room that killed charles um magneto wolverine kitty rogue all of them were there they were getting ready to shoot and if a mystique didn't put that on that gun in time the future would have been saved because at that very moment everything was stopped all the sent they saw that okay not all mutants are bad magneto he's still a problem but at least we're gonna have to have some safety precautions later on for these mutants or at least somebody to keep them in line so like that, the future was saved. Logan wakes up later in the future and it's like, I'm back in the mansion. I'm looking throughout the halls and I'm seeing Storm, Hank, in his beast form still. And it's like, huh, they're alive. We see Colossus, Kitty, Iceman with Rogue with her powers again. And he's walking around the mansion and he sees Jean Grey alive. And it's like, Jean and oop, right at the last second. Easy, pal. Cyclops alive and it's like, Oh my god, they got everybody back. Everything is back the way it was, finally. As Wolverine goes over to Charles and is like, I need you to refresh on some history for me. Everything after 1969. And Charles remembers, is like, you're back. And it's like, damn, everybody, everything. Even um Charles Xavier in the green suit. And even though it's not the hover chair, it's close enough to the hover chair. As we're going to get at that point. But it's like, yeah, everything is cool. Everything is accurate to the way it's supposed to be. And... By the end of this movie, Wolverine gets released from the water, and we see him getting brought in by William Stryker, which, yeah, it's kind of a funny reveal where it's like, oh, that's Mystique in disguise, but it's like, huh, Stryker got Wolverine, but that's not Stryker? Okay, the next movie's gonna have to fix that, but okay, but then again, the movie wasn't done just yet. We got a post credit scene in ancient Egypt with a new young mutant roaming around in Egypt building the pyramids with four horsemen in the background and it's like oh that's apocalypse and this being set up in the early 60s and current day that's gonna mean full-blown destruction because yep after 2014 it was like X-Men is back we know it and finally they got the X-Men movies right it took a long let's say a long period of movies to actually get to this point because we had the original trilogy which was fine yes the last one wasn't good but then again okay two out of three movies not bad the X-Men Origins comes out, does not bring the, everybody back to, to the X-Men franchise. It's like, okay, you ruined this again, and I feel like the next one you're going to do is not going to be as... It's not going to be good, and I feel like I lost all hopes on this. They bring in First Class, a new way to reintroduce the franchise to a new, younger audience, at least try to get some things right while also introducing some new elements into the mix. The Wolverine, it's, an, it's a good sequel, but now knowing that this is the timeline we're dealing with and they're going to be two different timelines that are all going to lead up to the same place because 
after the Wolverine, it was Days of Future Past. And Days of Future Past currently erased everything. So like that, X, everything from X-Men 1, 2, 3, Origins, the Wolverine that happened a year ago from that, don't matter. So now the timeline at that point turned into First Class and Days of Future Past. Everything after doesn't matter. So like that, we're going to be going to a whole new timeline of X-Men movies and a whole new set of adventures. And that's all I can talk about in this first part of the X-Men franchise. I got through half of it so far. And yes, I might not have described it. I might not have touched on everything lightly. Yes, I talked about some certain key points I liked and some of the ways I experienced it back in the day. But it's like, this is a franchise I feel like it evolved over time. But I feel like every time they want to hit a success, they'll get it. They'll enjoy it for that little moment. But it's more the fact that it's later on in this franchise where I feel like, okay... The first time you had good, you try to do a lot and it turned out bad. Just because you turned out bad doesn't mean you're always going to turn out some good. But I feel like with these next couple installments, there's something or at least a common factor I'm noticing where you'll get certain elements back together again, but it's more jumbled just like the timeline you just did. And that's all for today for part one of X-Men. I gotta say, next time, it's gonna be a bit more modest and some of these movies are a bit more enjoyable than the first half. Something about these X-Men movies in general, I feel like, yeah, they're a whole new studio doing them. It's not the way we see the Marvel movies nowadays, and back then it wasn't. Everything was still experimental, and not everything was going to be as it was, because you got to remember, just because these characters were in other studios, they weren't being able to use all the characters and all the storylines that they could have. They can call the names of it, they can interpret it in any way they want. But my thing is that, okay, yeah, they tried, but... Everything here is experimental. At least everything was leading up to great things. And we'll talk about that in our next episode. So thank you guys for listening. Leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already to the Oh Dear channel. Or should I say the O Review channel. And thank you guys for listening on the Oh Dear podcast. Thank you guys for your time. This is Oh Dear Herrera signing off. And good night or good evening or good day. And I'll see you next time. Still trying to figure out a way how to end this. Oh, <laughs>